I'm Dazon. Hey. And you're listening to Visible and Unseen, chronicling HIV in Black life, then, now, and next. We're amplifying stories and highlighting voices of Black folks in the movement. Some you know, and some you should know. Now let's jump in. So, hey, we are here. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, Robert, to Visible and Unseen, chronicling life, chronicling HIV in Black life. Robert Suttle, I am so excited. I'm glad you are here. Welcome into the space. How you doing? I'm doing well today, Dazon. It's a nice sunny day here in New York City, and the temperatures is in the 70s, almost touching 80s, and okay. I have not one complaint whatsoever. <laughs> that be the only time I'm coming to New York is when it's not cold and freezing. So good to know, good to know. Yeah. So we're going to just dive right on in. I am so excited to have this conversation with you today. First question right out the gate, because you know it's coming from my heart. How do you think being raised by a community of women prepared you for your journey? Oh, wow. That that is Mm. a good opening question, Dazon. Yeah, I've been raised by my mother, who was a young mother um, at the time when I was born, I mean, very young. (laughs) Uh, But thankfully, her mother, which was my grandmother, were were there. And even my grandmother on my my father's side was present in my life until her life um, Uh, ended while I was still young. And so I had a lot of aunts too. And so just growing up, they taught me a lot of things, uh, how to be respectful, how to be caring towards other people. I mean, I had a lot of cousins growing up um, from the South. And so, you know, it's all about relationships and family uh, down there. And so and also growing up in church, you know, as a teenager, at least at 11, if I can remember, you know, I was very involved in, in ministry, uh, youth ministry, music ministry. And I noticed how a lot of the women really came together to help with all sorts of programming and things like that, working with the youth ministry. I was a leader in the youth ministry and I would say a leader in the music ministry. And so to me, the women taught me the the, just how to be accountable and how to participate and be involved and that's I think a lot of that is why I gravitate so much toward our community in the advocacy work and the community work because women they taught me how to be there even when it wasn't if it was like the men's ministry event or or any type of event, they always showed up to help out even if Mm. it wasn't their program and so that is something that has stayed with me in, in my approach in my advocacy and being involved in the community. And so so between my home life and my church life, there's always been women there. And of course, my grandfather was uh, very instrumental in my life. And I think in one way, as a man, he was able to show me how to respect women, mm. you know, especially being around a lot of women. You know, there's very few men <laughs> around, but he at least taught me how to respect women and and how to obey, be obedient, and that sort of thing. And so I I appreciate and value the strength of a woman, of, of women in my life, because it has nurtured me down through the years. And and I and even still today, I, I still lean on on the strength of my grandmother, the strength of my aunts and my mother and my sisters now. So yeah. Do they continue to give you some of their sage sister, female, woman wisdom over time? And does that apply to your everyday life, your work life? What are you learning from them even now? I think what I'm learning from them even now is that they, they're always there, you know, through whatever I may be going through. And I appreciate that even in this present time, my aunt particularly, and I'm sharing this because it, it, it is something that touched me. You know, when I talked to her, she's asking me how I'm doing. You know, she knows that I am living with HIV. She knows that I identify as a, a gay man. And so I appreciate that because sometimes family members won't ask you those type of questions. And I appreciate her asking me because at least lets me know that she cares about me and the, the things that I'm going through. She asked me, are you dating anybody? You know, those sorts of things. And it feels good. Not everybody does that. 
but I appreciate the moment that she did it because it really caught me off guard. And but I appreciated it very much. Absolutely. I understand that. And I'm sure it has led itself into other experiences that you've had to go through. And I wanted to ask you a question about that, too. Mm -hmm. So given the work that you do and and have done, how has the issue of HIV criminalization, HIV criminalization changed in the past 20 years? That's about the time that I know that you've been doing this work. How has it changed over that time? Yeah, and this 20 years has been the time that I've been living with HIV. This year makes 20 years. And so HIV criminalization is the inappropriate use of the criminal law to punish people living with HIV for non-disclosure, for perceived exposure, and possibly transmission of HIV. Mm -hmm. And so these laws exist across the country in various states. So for those that are not familiar with it, I encourage you to look up HIV criminalization online and it'll, there's a lot of information there. I will say in terms of how it's changed, I am not the first person to be criminalized. Um, I, however, may be the first person to ever speak out about it. Mm. So I just want to make that distinction as a person with HIV. I am not the first. There have been several people that's been recorded a number of people that have been prosecuted. And so um, I've never known any of them to uh, go public themselves. However, there have been some, I say, high profile cases. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, Nushan Williams is an example uh, convicted here in New York state. And actually he still is in, in an incarcerated state um, under civil commitment, and mm -hmm. which is an issue that not many people know about. It's some that I'm still learning about and, I encourage you again, if you're not familiar with that, look that up. Civil commitment. Civil and it's considered commit Yeah, and it's considered to be a civil regulation and not anything punitive. Mm -hmm. Um but when someone has completed their time for mm -hmm. the initial convictions and charges, and then you still keep him in there ten years beyond that, there's something to that. And it's not necessarily all related to the previous conviction. They, they use that to, as a means of still keeping him there. And so, so that is just an example of sort of, I would say, an extreme case of HIV criminalization. Of course, it all is extreme and, and, and excessive in terms of sentencing. Right. It doesn't seem to be these sort of cases don't seem to be uh, decreasing. In fact, they are more likely increasing. Now, even with the introduction of antiretroviral treatment back in the mid-90s, even with all the prevention that we have around PrEP, pre-exposure, prophylaxis, and everything that we know in terms of the risk and transmission of HIV, where people who have undetectable viral loads are able to at least achieve that, or even people that are in care, are not able to transmit HIV to, to other people. So the treatment right. works. So with all of that, it doesn't seem to uh, have stopped these instances of, of criminalization. And currently I'm not seeing a lot of Facebook postings of people being prosecuted, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening because mm -hmm. a lot of times these cases have not been reported. It's just a very few that may make it through the media for all sorts of reasons or if they're high profile. And so it hasn't changed in terms of the prosecution. The laws are still there in, in a lot of states, but through my advocacy work over the past 10 years, uh, and just in recent years, we've been able to do some reform um, and even some repeal of certain of these laws in, in certain states. And so um, if you're, you know, for the, those that will be listening to this, if you're curious what those states are, you know, you can go online and, and definitely find uh, this information or even reach out to me and I'm happy to, you know, navigate and walk you through all of that but um, absolutely and we'll be sure to make sure that those resources are available through our socials and our location our website and that sort of stuff are visible and unseen you right. just drop some new dimes new gems on <laughs> me and so i gotta unpack a couple of things because i'm sure one is probably a tongue-in-cheek kind of curiosity question but i definitely need to unpack a little bit more a couple of questions around where we are now with criminalization and the fact that we're hearing less about it. First of all, is there ever, you talked about the inappropriate use of the criminalization statutes. Mm -hmm. Is there ever an appropriate use of these statutes? 
I really don't think there's an, a, an appropriate use um, of these of these statues. I mean, and if so, very rare, very slim situations because it's right now it's just so broad these laws are so broad that literally any the 1.2 million people living with hiv are potentially at risk of being prosecuted and so a lot of times people will say well what about this what about that and i was like well if there's a person um, unless they're saying that they're intending to do that Mm -hmm. then perhaps but there are also other general criminal laws that people can be prosecuted under. But we also need to assess that. We need to analyze whether this person in care, have they been in care, like what have they used protections, like what what's going on to make them feel the need to say these things about or, or what they are going to do. And so we find that a lot of these cases, there isn't uh, transmission, even when someone is accused of not disclosing. And so there's a lot of elements there that need to be examined um, before we just really start arresting people and having them charged and convicted of, of these particular crimes. Yeah. And I would wonder that given that there are so many other statutes that if a perceived or an ima- an alleged crime is happening, that there are other statutes that get used. And Mm -hmm. do you think that there's still some level of discrimination or stigmatizing using other statutes to persecute people because they have HIV, even, even, even if it's not under the HIV criminalization statute or approach? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I say we need to be very careful and very mindful of how we implement uh, how these laws are enforced. And um, it's, it's, it's so important because there are still people out there that discriminate uh, based on people living with HIV. And as I said earlier, regardless of the advancements that have been made, people still have negative views towards HIV, towards the people that it impacts, which are most likely black and brown people, um, mm-hmm. people of trans experience, gay men people who are involved in sex work. And so certain people have certain attitudes around those type of things. And so criminalization is just the greatest manifestation of stigma um, enshrined in the law. And so, yeah, it's not right. And I hope that most people will, if they are not familiar with this issue, will learn more about how that is. It's so nuanced and it's not just black Mm. and white. It's a lot, a lot there that needs to be addressed. Yeah. And thank you for that. I I tend to think that whether you're using the HIV criminalization statute per se, or in, in its obvious form, or people living with HIV are actually criminalized more even under the non-HIV statutes because yeah, of their that is, HIV. Yeah, that's that is, a reality as well. Yeah, that's so definitely that, possible. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Don't want to take us off of it, but are people with HIV the the only folks who are subject to this issue of civil commitment. I'm going to learn more about that, but I'm just wondering, is that something that's unique to the, the, the person that you spoke about, or is this something that is applied to folks in different cases? It's a, I believe it's, it's possibly applied to folks in different cases, for example, mm-hmm. rape cases. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm still learning myself, but I know that there are hundreds ah, to, to thousands okay. of people in different states across the country um, that are finding themselves in this situation. And I've actually met other advocates who are advocating on this issue. And so I would say it was maybe the past five or six years or so when I learned about it. And so it's so they're they're fighting just as much as we're fighting to address HIV criminalization laws. And so it is a very tough situation, a tough issue with civil commitment, just because, again, it's 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 looking at what's on paper and black and white and not really looking at where people are today versus, yeah. you know, looking at their past. And so it is something that has been around. But again, because they can get the governments, state governments and law enforcement can get away with it. Many people... Yeah don't and they don't know about it so they not, don't are, aren't are able to speak to it and so it just continues to happen yeah it's also reminiscent for me of can't remember that movie where people were literally being charged and convicted for thinking about or for their 
predilection for possibly committing a crime. Mm -hmm. So we're going to lock you up now to get you off the streets before you even do something to somebody, which is what it sounds like. The name of the movie will come back to me. But thank you for sharing that, because I really I think that's really critical for folks to learn that even as we try to normalize the struggles against HIV criminalization, that that doesn't stop the criminalization of people with HIV. And I think that that is a really important place that that you just raised for me as a key thing to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well as the sex offender registry. I I like I see the civil commitment as being like that even next step. You know, you think that Mm -hmm. the registry is worse. (laughs) It's like there's another level to this. It just gets deeper and deeper in terms of these civil regulations, they like to call it. But there's nothing very civil like about someone being on a registry whatsoever. So, uh, yeah. I understand that it's it's still about dignity and justice. It's not just justice. So there's some intersectionality in what you're talking about now, right? Mm -hmm. That this is connected to other things. So talk about some of the other critical issues that are happening in the Black community that connect to your work in HIV. Yeah, so I talked about HIV criminalization. Um, Mm -hmm. That's a barrier, of course. And then, of course, addressing HIV-related stigma is, you know, a, a barrier. So I say that to say, because we, it's all about for people living with HIV and mm-hmm. people generally probably understand it's about having a better quality of life. And so the other issues that, you know, potentially impact are around our sexual orientation and around class, mental health, people who may have history of, of drug use or incarceration. So there's, you know, and even those that are involved in sex work or, so it's those things that definitely intersect with with criminalization and, and HIV. And so we want to address those barriers, which is why I brought that up. But the goal is to get people to having a better quality of life. And we're still finding that we're still dealing with those barriers <laughs> even today, which also mm-hmm. impacts the are tied to the structural issues that we deal that we need to deal with and address that the things that create these environments that where people may find themselves at risk for HIV or criminalization, you know, it, it just really impacts the prevention work and really want folks to, to know that, that to understand these barriers and to understand that we'll never get to zero as, as we're, you know, there's all these campaigns out there about that. We can never get there mm-hmm. until we start addressing the structural issues as well as um, the barriers. I totally agree. And I so, so understand how all those intersections are working. And then when you layer that with race and with mm-hmm. gender yes. in all of its dimensions and class or caste, even in all of its dimensions, then it even further exacerbates some of those uh, challenges and barriers that you were talking about. And so I can appreciate that deeply. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you're not very old, but you've still (laughs) been in this a while. (laughs) You've still been in this a pretty long while. And Mm -hmm. as much as we can think about where we've been and about what the work is right in front of us, this is going to be happening. This is what the struggle is about, right? It goes on for a while. So I'm wondering if you've been thinking about this, but who are you passing the baton to? What's next? Who's next? What are you preparing and who are you preparing for to come behind you in this work? Everybody. (laughs) (laughs) And I, I do mean that, you know, yeah. It reminds me of something that people, someone says, who's buying your albums? And you know, the person says, everybody. So I'm saying everybody. I'm preparing yeah. everybody. And and I say that, and I feel like it's it's really happening uh, ever since I've been speaking. Now, other people have, have learned about this issue and are speaking. And so really, this should be a everybody kind of thing. But I know that there are those unique people, extraordinary people who, you know, who will accept, take up the mantle and, and, and keep going. But right now, I really wish that our that our whole community would do that. But there is a lot of people right now. And I don't know, Dazon, I, I, I continue to think on that. I know there are people who are lawyers, young lawyers, uh, people who are young activists who are just want to get involved. And so they have sort of this interest and curiosity 
Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm thinking that at some point or level, a lot of them have written about it. A lot of them have done some research and in, in, while they're in college. So that makes me feel good to know that, that at some point, someone's going to step up. But right now we do have a community of people who, um, uh, black leaders or people living with HIV and advocates that are compassionate about this issue. The Health Not Prisons Collective has a new cohort of advocates coming in. And so I'm thrilled that a, a lot of us are getting involved, particularly black and brown people, because this is definitely our fight and we definitely should be leading leading this. And so, and there's a lot of other leaders too, who those have been impacted. So I'm not the only one. Um, they've been using their voices and, and their platforms to speak out in based on their experiences. Because all of us have different experience, but it all sort of relates similar patterns of stigma and HIV criminalization in various states. So, uh, yeah. but I think in another 10 years, ask me that question. I probably could name (laughs) you. Yeah, it gets hard there too. Trust me. Yeah. And the way you talk about the current leaders and how we're all chipping in and that sort of, it makes me think about how to think about this whole movement. And that is we are almost like a a relay marathon. You know, most Mm -hmm. relay races are, you know, 200, 400 meters or, you Mm -hmm. know, totally not an athlete, but uh, in those, you know, bands of distance. But in this context, it's a, it's every 26 Ks you're handing yeah. over another baton. It really is a relay marathon. It's a and marathon, not a sprint. Yes. It's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> and we're still passing it on and running at the same time. So yeah, I, I absolutely feel you on that one. So I'm going to just take privilege that we talked about who you're passing on to next. I want to know, because I know that you're um, starting to move in different circles and in different works. And so what's next so that I don't think Robert Suttle is living with this HIV criminalization hero for the rest of his life. What's next for Robert Suttle? Yes. What's next for me? I'm currently working on building my con- consultancy, if you will. Mm-hmm. I do have a passion for people learning about social issues beyond HIV, beyond HIV criminalization, because again, based on your identity and, and ways that you identify, like those things are definitely impacted. And I want people to just understand who they are and understand history. So I, I'm very passionate and moving towards social movements. And so I really want to educate young people, particularly because they do care about social issues. And based on the mm-hmm. research, you know, they are very much uh, interested. And this is the what activist generation <laughs> for young people. And so it is uh, perfect for me to be able to connect with them and share my experience as far as my advocacy and how I got involved, but then also to broaden their minds about a, a lot of issues, social issues and how they intersect. And so my intent is also to write a memoir about my lived experience and and to again use that as a tool to educate. So I'm all about advocacy and education. That that is that is really where I am right now. And I'm really glad to be in that space because I've learned so much and I really feel like I have a lot to share. Oh, we know you do, and we can't wait. I can't wait for the audio version. I could just hear Robert telling me his story and his memoir in my ears. I can't wait for that. Yeah. Robert, thank you so, so, so very much for your time, for your energy, for your sharing of your own story, your experience, and the things that you think about, because mm-hmm. that's what this conversation is meant to be. It's also not just to let folks know what our history is, but it's also to know who we have been in this work. And I, and I know how special and important you have been in this work. And so thank you so very much for coming on Visible and Seen and sharing that with us. Thank you so much. And it's always good to talk to you. So it's just like I'm talking to an aunt or mother or, yeah, so yeah, thank you. I'll receive that. I'll receive that. That means I would have had to been like five to have you, but I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I was. Uh, I would have been of age, sadly. But anyway, I love you, Robert. Thank love you so you too, much. Jason. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Visible and Unseen. 
I'm your host, Dazon, and I'm also the founder and president of Sister Love Incorporated. To find out more about this podcast and the work we do at Sister Love, visit us online, www.sisterlove.org, or follow us on Instagram at Sister Love Inc. And tune in next time for another episode of Visible and Unseen. And much appreciate love.